Wallenberg did not personally save 100,000 Jews. But you're a hero if you only help 5,000 too, or you're a hero if you help 50. So how many did Raoul Wallenberg help and save in Budapest during World War II? This is World of Swedish History. My name is Johan Romin and I'm a Swedish journalist producing this podcast. And in this episode you'll hear historian Paul Levin talk about the Swedish effort to save Jews during World War II. Paul Levin used to live and work at Uppsala University, but since some years back he's working in Berlin. He has published a book about Raoul Wallenberg in which he presented many new facts about the, the ad hoc diplomat Wallenberg. One of the more controversial findings was that Raoul Wallenberg made business contacts with the Germans and the Nazis at the same time as he was working day and night to help Jews in Budapest, Hungary. I am very happy to present Paul Levine, which I met and interviewed for the first time in 1997. This is the world of Swedish history. 75 years ago, uh, the Germans had just marched into Hungary. And uh, can you tell me a little bit what happened in Hungary when the Germans came in there? Well, what did they start to do there? Well, why did why did the Germans first of all? Why did the Germans march in to an a an allied country? Why did they occupy militarily in you know the next to last year of the war? Is because they you know the the Red Army of course was coming up through Romania. And they needed to strengthen their defenses to the southeast. And they were dissatisfied that the Hungarians had not, in the main, destroyed their Jewish population. In March 1944, Hungary had the largest remaining Jewish population alive. It's somewhere 800,000, some people say a million. And this... The Germans were determined to destroy as much of Europe's Jewish population as they could uh, before the war, before they collapsed. Mind you, March 44 is, what, two and a half, three months before D-Day, the invasion of of Western Europe. So it's not like the Germans were in a good position militarily. And then came I, Eichmann came in, you know, with a very specific commando, a very specific uh, group under his command, and they got to work very quickly. Yeah. And when did this deportation for Auschwitz-Birkenau start? Those began on the 15th of May. And where they began is of interest. Why they began there is of interest. But the, but the Hungarian Holocaust represents one of, if not the bloodiest episodes of Holocaust history. Between the 15th of May and the 7th of July or 9th of July, that date differs a little bit, they deported 432,000 Jews in like 45 days, Mm. gassing to death and cremating up to 12,000 people a day in the spring summer uh, of 1944. And this again is when the Germans had no hope whatsoever to win the war militarily. So, and one can analyze and describe this issue on uh, on many different levels, but it, it is long after the war is uh, decided, this is after Stalingrad, this is after uh, not after D-Day, but of course, you know, after Italy and such, the Germans still had the ideological fervor to destroy as many Jews as they could. And they were very successful in Hungary. Yeah. And Raoul Wallenberg, where, what was he doing in March and April and in May of 1944 before he came to Budapest? Uh, by by April May he was he had been contacted by the Jewish community he was in contact with Ivar Olsen uh, he was in contact with the WR the War Refugee Board's agent uh, the American agent uh, in Stockholm and by m- uh, May June he is actively preparing 
to take up his mission. Now, I'm in, some historians say he was an American agent, an American spy, an American diplomat in some way, and I completely reject this interpretation. He was a Swedish diplomat, an ad hoc Swedish diplomat, who, because of whom he was, both as a Wallenberg and the quite the highly intelligent, charismatic, uh, sophisticated young man that he was, he was given a chance. As I say, the mission met the man and the man met the mission. But of course, we can't forget all that went on with Swedish diplomacy in the Holocaust prior to Wallenberg's arrival in Budapest on the 9th of July, 1944. That's part of the story I've told over the years now. And when he arrived in the beginning of July, what did he think he was going to be able to do there? They, well, he had a very specific mission to help ongoing efforts. And how? what were those ongoing efforts? Well, we, we must speak about Swedish diplomats, the Swedish legation, in one on one hand and then the the combined and different efforts of the other neutral diplomats in budapest at that same time now uh, the background to that is why were these diplomats allowed to help jews in the middle of nazi occupied europe yeah it seems quite strange this would have been unthinkable in Warsaw, summer of 1942, at the height of the deportations to Treblinka, it would have been unthinkable. The diplomats would have been thrown out of the country. They would have been, you know, harassed or or even, you know, injured or whatever, right? Two years later, the geopolitical situation of the war is very, very different. And the Germans because you asked before about why did the Germans invade Hungary? Well, a key element here is that the Germans never uh, never got full control of Hungary. They never had full sovereignty, okay? Mm-hmm. The, the Budapest municipal authorities and the Hungarian national authorities always maintained a position of some leverage, if you will. And the Hungarians, all who have their own story with the Jews, both before and during the, the, the Holocaust, the Hungarians didn't want to help the Germans as much, not all the Hungarians, that is to say. So the geopolitical situation, it allows neutral diplomacy room to maneuver, as I like to say. Yeah. And they, to, to their credit, they, the Swiss, the Vatican to a degree, the, uh, the Spaniards had left, the Swedes, the International Red Cross, these neutral diplomats began to more and more coordinate their efforts through the summer into the fall of 1944. And they were allowed to do so because of the situation. So what did... Um... Uh, Mr. Wallenberg do during the summer months? Well, that's interesting. When he first arrived, what he did was mainly <laughs> set up an office. He he wrote long, detailed, extended reports of, of all the telephones he was buying and the people he was employing. What he did was strengthen the effort, <clears throat> which I have called bureaucratic resistance, mm-hmm. of the Swedes to give out different diplomatic papers to protect Hungarian Jews. And he was sent there to increase Per Anger and Ivan Danielson had made it very clear they needed more help. The original idea had been to send Volker Berendo, the head of the Swedish Red Cross, Mm. but the Germans wouldn't give him a visa. And Wallenberg, for whatever reason, they gave the visa and Wallenberg arrived on the 9th of July and both strengthened and broadened ongoing diplomatic resistance. 
that was going on. And that is to say, transferring Swedish citizenship, Swedish protection, Swedish sovereignty onto Hungarian Jews. Mm. And because it's 1944 and not 1942, it worked. Not all the time, not every single case, but it was a matter of paper protecting people. So did he start to give those passports, the safety passports, um, from the summer? Or when did he start to do that? Well, what he is known for, the Schutzpass, the the Berem, the famous uh, Swedish Schutzpass, is just a uh, improvement of different documents which the Swedes have been giving out. That Schutzpass is has no value under international law, but yet it was accepted because of the circumstances. Now, one of the most valuable documents was a Swedish passport, and that the Swedes gave out in very limited numbers Mm -hmm. and only in specific cases. So to repeat myself, Wallenberg expanded the both network and volume of paper protection being distributed both by the Swedish legation and by the Swiss legation. So when did people start to see Wallenberg in the streets? Because there has been a lot of reports he was uh, helping people there and setting up safe houses, and he was very much in the street helping people. Uh, Well, as I say, 15th of October 1944, Wallenberg enters history. Because between July and October, he was essentially just a a second-level diplomat, authorized diplomat at the Swedish legation. And as I said, had been expanding paper protection efforts. Mm. If I... Why the 15th of October? That requires a different explanation. (laughs) That is the Arrow Cross coup when the Germans finally lost patience with the, uh, if you will, normal Hungarian government, they finally lost patience and allowed the Nidlash, the Hungarian Arrow Cross, to take power. Uh, Salashi, Ferenc Salashi, became prime minister, and he had wanted to become prime minister under the Nazi Germans already in March, but they didn't allow him to, to ascend to that position. Hmm. But on the 15th of October, Horty, the, the head of the, the official head of the Hungarian government, his government had gotten too deeply involved in efforts to withdraw from the war, as Romania had done in August. Because, of course, you have to keep in mind the Red Army is sweeping up from the southeast getting ever closer to Budapest, right? Mm. Slowly, with tremendous casualties, as always, the Germans, with their brilliant defensive tactics, slowed the Red Army down. And then finally, on the 15th, Hitler, Himmler, uh, Kaltenbrunner, whoever was making the decisions, Eichmann was involved, not at that level, but he was certainly there, They decided enough with the Hungarian government. Now we're going to put the Hungarian Nazis into power. Hmm. And it's on that date that the real street violence against Budapest Jews uh, began. Let's keep in mind at this point by October 44, as I said, almost 450,000 Jews from the countryside had already been deported 330,000 murdered hmm. in Auschwitz-Birkenau and elsewhere. <clears throat> so all when we speak about Wallenberg and Hungary, we are speaking only about the Jews of Budapest. And they were allowed to serve. They had survived to that point because of an argument between Adolf Eichmann and the Hungarians in March of 44. And that is that the Hungarians, they wanted, no, excuse me, Eichmann wanted to 
deport and get rid of Budapest Jews first. Oh, before but the, the countryside. Before the countryside. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the Hungarians sort of, Horty and others sort of favored Budapest's rather sophisticated Jewish population. But the, the Jews in the countryside, even though they were not all Hasidic or anything like that, they were seen as Eastern Jews. And they were the much more foreign Jews. Mm. And because the Germans did not, this, because without Hungarian manpower, none of this could have taken place, right? Mm. So the Hungarians said, no, we want to empty the countryside first. And they did. Uh, as I said, beginning on the they, ghettoization began in mid-April. Ghettoization in this case meaning very short-lived assembly points. And then once that operation was done, it was only the Jews, approximately 200,000 or so, different numbers people have for the actual numbers, but it was only by, by late August, September 44, it was only the Budapest Jews still alive. And of course, Budapest is where the neutral diplomats are operating where they have room to maneuver and they did so and then everything changes as i've said on the 15th of october and wallenberg becomes very visible on the streets not certainly not in the movie versions i've tried to document this uh, a little bit more carefully than most have let alone movie versions but I argue, or I, I make a point, it's not a big argument I make in my work, but uh, Wallenberg may have saved more lives by negotiating with the sanitation department of the city of Budapest for the Swedish houses and for the other neutral, by houses we mean apartment buildings in, in Bud Budapest, right? They called them, they didn't call them safe houses, they called them Swedish houses or Swiss houses or Vatican houses, hmm. et cetera. And that, you know, the, of course the conditions in these houses are, are terrible, but still livable. You can survive them. And everyone knows of course, where the red army is. This is after D-Day, right? Everyone knows it's only a matter of time. So how to survive. And Wallenberg by negotiating in a very normative fashion with municipal authorities, before October, saved lives also. Mm. Did he um, negotiate directly with the Eichmann and, and the Nazis? According to my reading of the documentation, uh, they, met, they may have met only once in, at Hege Shalom on the border. That's what the documentation says. Mm. Eichmann's telephone number is in Wallenberg's telephone book. You know, little telephone book he he, he carried mm. his di his diary, and there is this alleged meeting, uh, in which in the movie versions and in other journalistic versions you'll see him convincing Eichmann to feel guilty, mm. morally culpable. This, of course, is complete nonsense, mm. and and nor did they meet. Okay because Wallenberg would have filed a report home about that. He would not have kept that secret. So you, you don't believe in this movie version of the... Well, look, I, it, it's complete historical fantasy. Hmm. It makes for a good movie version, but it's historical fantasy. Eichmann at the time, he, and his story is of great interest. You know, in, it's, the, it's the height of his career, Hungary, 1944, in, as a Jew killer the height of his career, but he was drinking a lot, womanizing, smoking a lot, and he was sent back and forth after the deportations ended in July. He actually left the country for a few weeks, but then from the 15th of October, or even before, I don't remember exactly the date, came back to Budapest. But Eichmann himself is his authority is greatly exaggerated. The Swedes were in constant connection with the Germans in Berlin, as well as 
you know, the, the Swedes had an active embassy here in Berlin, right? Mm. Uh, what, what, what's uh, Rickert, Arvid Rickert, of course, mm. and jo Joran van Otte, Joran van Post, and the others who were here. And the, the, the diplomatic reports are going uh, back and forth. So the Swedes are negotiating with the Germans both in Budapest and in Berlin. And you see this in the paper flow very clearly. Mm. And, the, and the negotiations were, you know, to a degree successful. But again, it's not because the Nazis didn't want to kill Jews. They were less able to. And they couldn't lose entirely Hungary's cooperation, Hungary's collaboration. So again, the, but these are very complicated day-to-day -day issues, which are difficult to summarize in a few sentences. But nonetheless, it's it, to me as a historian, and my work has not been criticized by real historians, unlike some Swedish journalists, um, my, ver my, uh, my, uh, what word? My representation of what Wallenberg and the Swedes did in Budapest has not been challenged by uh, knowledgeable people. Hmm. So when did the Arrow Cross movement start to shoot people along the river in Budapest? This occurred the 15th of October is when it really begins. And it doesn't happen in a systematic way. You know, sometimes there's a couple of instances in which Wallenberg did save people on the on the riverbank. On you know, on the, uh, everyone knows Budapest doesn't have riverbanks, but the keys there. Uh, there's a couple of instances which are documented that he that he intervened successfully. Uh, but this is when the if you will, the wild pogroms begin because, and who are the arrow cross at this point? Stupid drunk old men and stupid drunk young men with guns who decide, okay, we have a chance to get rid of these Jews, which we've never liked, whom we've never liked. And this is when the, the because, because of course, Train connections to Auschwitz-Birkenau had been cut off long before October. The deportations had ended in, ju in July, and there was no more train connection. So if they were going to uh, destroy the Jews, they had to do it either in Budapest or, uh, or along what are called the death marches to the northwest towards the Austrian border and the famous border town of Hegi Shalom, where Wallenberg may well have encountered Eichmann at one point. Or actually he did, I, I don't remember the exact report. It's been many years since I read that report, but, but and this again is when Wallenberg and Per Anger, they're driving along the route, because again, how do the, what, what does a death march mean? Well, it means old women, young children, old men marching slowly in the European late fall, early winter, you know, uh, hundreds of kilometers. Mm. So the Swedes were able to drive up and down and they didn't, they never gave out wholesale, oh, here's a batch of Schutzpass. This again is movie nonsense. But the Swedes and some of the other neutral diplomats did make efforts to help the Jews along the death marches. Mm. But these efforts, of course, are very, you know, almost, uh, uh, what word am I looking for? O almost uh, meaningless, because they can only help a few people of the hundreds, the many hundreds. And, of course, people are dying along the roadside. And they see this as well. So the, from the 15th of October until the liberation of first Buddha, then Pe uh, first Pest, then Buddha, the Hungarian Jews were, excuse me, the Budapest Jews, Hungarian, of course, for the, for the most part. This is when they were destroyed. You know, tens of thousands of them were killed in a matter of weeks. Mm. But, but again, in real history, rather than fictional history, one day precedes the next, one day succeeds the next, and the circumstances are never the same one week to the next. 
So it's a shifting and absolutely fascinating. I've always said my book would make a good movie, but <laughs> no one seems to be interested. <laughs> So what's the biggest difference between the movie version of Ral Wallenberg and the real, uh, what, what you can see in the historical sources? Well, he was a real man, not an angel of rescue sent by chance to Budapest to save Budapest Jews. But this is, the, this is the, the movie version, let's call it the romanticized version. People want to believe these stories. People prefer to believe stories of rescue rather than of murder. But the reality is different. And my version is, is based on hundreds and hundreds of documents mm. and, and the research of others. And of course, my own, in my own understanding of the situation and my understanding deepened over the years from when we first met. And then when I you know published my book now, uh, now, nine years ago. <laughs> uh, and why is my book called Raoul Wallenberg in Budapest, Myth, History, Holocaust? Because there are uh, uh, many myths which surround the real Wallenberg. It's not like talking about, was there a real Jesus? Was there not, right? There is a real Wallenberg who was a real man who worked his ass off in Budapest. He what was a hero there. And at the same time, negotiating with different Hungarian and German businessmen for post-war business opportunities. Because it's very interesting, if we want to talk about the romanticized version of Wallenberg, Somehow people got it into their minds that he went to Budapest and his life ended. No, he went to Budapest for a variety of reasons, but he thought he would have a life afterwards. He didn't plan on, his, on being captured by the Red Army and never getting back to Sweden. He wanted, he was only 32 years old. He was a young man when he was there, right? Mm. And he was a Wallenberg. He knew who he was. And okay, he hadn't worked as closely with Jacob and Mar Marcus Jr. as he wished, but nonetheless, he was a Wallenberg and he cer certainly saw a, a life after Budapest. And I've been criticized very heavily by the family and others in Sweden because I said, this Holocaust hero did business in Budapest. And why do I know that? The documentation. People don't like when heroes do business during a genocide, but this is what Wallenberg did for fully understandable reasons. At the same time that he was working, you know, nonstop, 20 hours a day, whatever it would have been, to save human beings in the calmer months before October, he was looking for business opportunities in accordance with his partner in Stockholm, uh, Koloman Lauer who he had worked with, of course, in the several years before going to Budapest, which was a Hungarian-Swedish export company. These are the real details of history, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but it takes time both to tell them and it takes more time to read them. Mm -hmm. And most people prefer, it's easier. They have such busy lives. It's easier with the romanticized version, mm -hmm. but, but that, that's not real history. So what kind of business was it? Oh, the agricultural import-export business. <clears throat> According to Wallenberg's own calendar, he met SS Colonel Kurt Bescher six times. Kurt Bescher was Himmler's right-hand man in Budapest for economic issues. Kurt Bescher, who was a Nazi and who killed Jews, that's not the issue, but Kurt Bescher was in Budapest to do business, not to kill Jews. Because when the Germans marched in, again, I, I go back and forth, and I hope your listeners will be able to hang with me. But when the Germans marched in, in March 44, they expropriated vast amounts of Hungarian industries. They took them over for their own economic necessities, their own economic needs. 
And Wallenberg met Kurt Bescher, who died a happy man in Hamburg when he was 95 years old, one of, you know, one of Germany's Jew killers who died safely in bed. He met him why for six times. I don't know exactly why. They didn't write reports. But if you're a very busy man, why do you meet one individual six times? There's a reason for it. Mm. Mm. And it, I made myself very unpopular among some circles in Sweden for saying what the documentation told me. Well, it's uh, important to put everything on the pa- on the table, right? It's more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually much more interesting. But if we go back to the rescuing effort uh, in the in the months, how how many people would you say did Wallenberg help or save during this dramatic? Well, of months? course, that's a very important question, both of history and memory. In the folk moonet, you know, in people's imagination, if you ask the average educated person, how many people did Wallenberg save? A hundred thousand. This is the number he was given. This is the the number of people which memory assigned to his name, and that for various reasons. This is, of course, historical nonsense. Wallenberg did not personally save 100,000 Jews, but you're a hero if you only help 5,000 too, or you're a hero if you help 50. I estimate that Wallenberg and the Swedes saved, assisted, or or rescued maybe 20,000 Budapest Jews. And that's a pretty impressive historical achievement. Now, where do those numbers come from? And why do I use those different words? Because a Jew who was saved one day with a Swedish Schutzpass in, say, October 29th, could be shot on October 31st by a young kid with a rifle who didn't accept his paper. Okay, so how do we count that person? It's impossible. You, and, and the figures don't, you know, it's what he did is far more important than, than uh, numbers. Hmm. But I, my estimation, and it is only an estimation, is up to 20,000 people, the vast majority of them who were sheltered in Swedish diplomatic houses, the Swedish houses in the international ghetto, it was called, and then in other locations throughout the, you know, the, the urban center of Budapest. And there were also other houses. So, so to repeat myself, I say up to 20,000 people were either saved or assisted by the Swedes. Hmm. But 100,000 is, is complete nonsense. There's a, there's a book on, uh, by a Swiss historian about Karl Lutz, the Swiss diplomat who became famous for his efforts in Budapest. And uh, uh, in the book, he's given credit with saving 182,000 Jews. Well, if, then if you add together his Jews and so I'd say Wallenberg's Jews and the Vatican's Jews and the International Red Cross Jews, more Jews were saved than actually lived in Budapest, mm. which, of course, is complete. You know, mm. it's mythical. It, these these numbers belong to myth. But the figure of 100,000 Jews saved by one man caught the popular imagination. And once something in such circumstances catches the popular imagination, it's very difficult to get a real understanding into people's heads. In January 45, the Red Army came into Budapest and they captured this, the city. The Arrow Cross movement, when the Red Army came into the city, what happened to the Arrow Cross movement. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm sure Hungarian Holoc- uh, Hungarian historians, <clears throat> excuse me, know a lot more about that than I do. But Budapest was surrounded uh, on Christmas Day or the day before Christmas '44. It was, you know, the, the Red Army had, had encircled Budapest, 
and of course, to, once again, to understand these things as real history, one has to have a sense of geography. And the Red Army, in fact, encircled Budapest before trying to get into it. The Red Army came in first from the northeast. Excuse, well, they, from, they penetrated Budapest from the northeast uh, initially. And what happened? Well, many of these thugs were caught and uh, punished in one form or another. Salashi was, ex was uh, executed by uh, the Red Army, you know, by the, the post-war authorities um, already in Oct October 45. I don't remember exactly when uh, the head of the Nat uh, the Arrow Cross was was uh, convicted and executed. Um, so, but that that's a very interesting question. My guess would be, typically, that the vast majority never were caught and went on to live good lives, or you know, went on to live normal lives. That would be my guess. That up to ninety percent of the Arrow Cross members if you want to call them that, uh, probably had no uh, escaped punishment and went on to live normal lives. But, uh, but this is something, this is, I, I don't know for a fact, but it's an interesting question of, of how do we punish the perpetrators of genocide? Well, in every genocide that we have studied, the vast majority of perpetrators are never punished, never caught, and don't feel terribly guilty for what they had done. So if we go back to the Swedish effort, why was it important for Swedish government to help uh, Jews in, in Europe? Well, as we know, as I wrote about <laughs> all those years when we first met, Swedish diplomacy and the Holocaust, Swedish diplomacy to help Jews had all had begun noticeably in October, November 1942, when the so-called final solution struck Norway, Norway's Jews, in which approximately 50%, uh, close to a thousand, were deported, the vast majority murdered. And approximately 50% of Norway's Jews managed to escape over the border into Sweden, where they were welcomed and given assistance. Until 1942, Sweden was very happy with, one wouldn't say happy, but Sweden was perfectly uh, satisfied to continue all relationships with Nazi Germany, cultural, military, economic, political, etc. From when did the when did the Holocaust start? 33? No. 41? Well, that's when the, the mass killing began. But when the final solution came to Scandinavia, as I've written about, we're speaking about a brother folk, a, you know, a brotherly people. These are not Czech Jews. These are not Polish Jews. These are Norwegian Jews or the most of the others, German Jews who would escape there earlier. And Sweden could not turn its back on Scandinavian Jews. But importantly, in, in, at this time, Sweden kept its efforts a secret. Why did Sweden help Jews? Well, Sweden is a country of compassion and of a feeling of uh, medchensla you know, for, for your fellow human being. There's no question about that. At the same time, Sweden, as I, as I say, it, at the same time that Sweden is saving Jews in ever increasing numbers, it's keeping the Wehrmacht in business with Yernmal, with iron ore. So it's like, a, it's like a double standard then? It's a paradox. Mm. It's, a, it's a hypocrisy, it's a double standard, but it's a paradox, which... History has more paradoxes than it does cut and dry black and white pictures, right? Mm. So then we get throughout the summer of 43, Sweden's diplomats are helping individual Jews in different places in Paris, in Prague, in Berlin, 
in Amsterdam, et cetera. And then comes the final solution to Denmark, in which, of course, Sweden famously and publicly opened its borders. On what is it, the 3rd of October, 1942, Sweden announced to the world, we, any Jew who gets to our borders will be let in. And it announced it to the world. So for the first time since 1933, when Hitler came to power, a sovereign nation said, we will help any Jew we can. And of course, everything is interconnected. What's going on in Denmark is known by Danielson and Anger in Budapest. And what's very interesting, and as you know, Yuan, the guy in the center of my studies have, have, was uh, Undersecretary of UDE, of the Foreign Ministry, Yesta Inksel. And crucially, his efforts to expand Swedish protection in, in the variety of fashions I've tried to describe here was never hindered. It was never stopped by his superiors in the foreign office or by uh, Per Alvin Hansen, the Swedish prime minister at the time. Uh, in other words, his efforts were allowed to continue. So it's this whole step-by-step -step which is efforts at helping Jews. And once Sweden understood also, importantly, that to help Jews re relieves pressure from the allies who were putting a lot of pressure on Sweden to cut off all trade with Germany. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. Everything is ongoing at the same time. And Sweden, you know, that's just smart politics. That's politics of humanitarianism. That said, it's very clear the, the Swedish diplomats and many others, uh, many other Swedes who were involved in these efforts did so wholeheartedly. They didn't say, oh, I'm helping my country's economy by issuing this paper. No, they were motivated by genuine humanitarianism. And as I have said, to Sweden's eternal credit, it expanded its net of activities once it discovered it could help Jews diplomatically. What, what do you think happened to Raul Wallenberg after he was captured by the Russians? Okay, as I say in my book, uh, this is, was not my area of research. I've never looked into this other than reading about it. Of course, Sweden's government uh, put, put together two commissions in what was it, 1991, uh, with the, after the fall of the Soviet Union to find him. Then the Eliasson Commission to, to discover really what happened to Wallenberg according to the Swedes. So I am not an ec I'm not a a research expert, but of course I have my ideas. Wallenberg's big mistake was to think that he could personally negotiate with the Red Army, and he left the safety of Budapest. Pest. He left the safety of the city on the 17th of January 1945, and was never seen again. According, and then he was taken from Debrecen to Bucharest to Kiev, then to Moscow, and put into Lubyanka mm -hmm. as a suspect diplomat. But there were other diplomats, Swiss diplomats, and other diplomats who had been detained or captured, call it what you want, by the Red Army. So, what happened? All of the investigation. And the film, there's been, you know, countless documentaries and, and books about it. And, and some people have devoted their lives to trying to find out what happened to, to Raoul, they always call him, mm. to, to, to Wallenberg. And the two, uh, my understanding, and I think it's a, a, a secure one, the two main questions, why did they detain him? And why did they not let him go back home have never been answered. And most likely he was murdered in July 47 in Lubyanka prison, most likely. 
But I've mentioned the other Swedish diplomats, uh, Per Anger, Ivan Danielsson, uh, Lars Berg, and the others. They were also detained by the Red Army several weeks after Wallenberg. They were sent back to Moscow along the same route. And while in Moscow, they met Söderblom, the ambassador. And then in April 45, they were back in Stockholm. April 45, before the war ends, Wallenberg's mother, Mai, is standing on the docks in Stockholm saying, where's my son? Why is he not with this group? And we don't know. There's lots of speculation about him being an American spy, which, is, which I find still nonsense. But the, the, to repeat myself, we don't know why he was detained in a different way than the other Swedish and other neutral diplomats <clears throat> and why the Soviets never let him back. I consider it to be one of the greatest scandals in Swedish history that the Swedish government did not put far greater pressure on the Soviet Union, on Stalin in 45, 46, 47. Because let me remind you, we are speaking of a Wallenberg. We're not speaking of Sven Svensson. Mm -hmm. We're speaking of a Wallenberg. Jakob Wallenberg and Marcus Wallenberg Jr. were the most powerful people in Sweden apart from the government. Why they didn't turn over heaven and hell to get their cousin back, we don't know. At least I've never seen a convincing explanation. Mm -hmm. But I consider this to be a an enormous scandal. Why did Sweden not recognize Wallenberg until, what, 96 officially, something like that? Why did it take a, an American Jew who didn't speak a word of Swedish to study these issues? Yeah, very why, did not, why did not Sweden make Wallenberg a hero in 1949, 1957, et cetera? but didn't and there's all there's lots of mysteries but there's always reasons behind these mysteries nothing happens except in a natural disaster or whatever nothing happens in history by accident one of the core issues when trying to understand the horrible phenomena of genocide is the fact that people choose to murder enormous groups of other people if they're able to under whatever are the circumstances, right? It's a matter of choice. Raoul Wallenberg chose to go to Budapest when he could have stayed in neutral Sweden. I spoke before about him seeing a post-war future for himself. Of course he did, he was 32 years old, right? Hmm. Wallenberg chose to go to Budapest to help people he'd never met. He didn't know of a different religion, he was not a religious man, but culturally, Wallenberg had his own, Raoul had his own anti-Semitic feelings, which I, you know, which are in the documentation as well, not seriously, but the man chose to leave safety to go to help others. And this is why he's important to, the, to his, the history of the Holocaust and to uh, world history. Wallenberg became important in the post-war era because of being captured by the Soviets rather than understanding what he did in Budapest. He's a hero for what he did, not for how he died. But then we have to talk about Cold War issues and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wallenberg does not, is not a prominent figure in Holocaust memory until November 1980. And why is that significant? Because in December 79, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, right? Mm. And this is when the Cold War took on another edge. You know, it, it's all that's another discussion. But Wallenberg was seen as a figure of the West that could be used as a club to beat the Soviets over the proverbial head. And that's, then we get into issues of the politics of memory. Mm -hmm. But 
Wallenberg is important not for how he died, but for the ch choice he made to help others. And when given that opportunity by history, by circumstances, the man worked his ass off and never returned home as a result. And that's, it's like a great Greek tragedy. He is a hero, but he has long been a misunderstood hero, but he's a hero for what he did, not for how he died in Stalinist Russia. Thanks, Paul Levine, and thank you for listening to the World of Swedish History. Please join me on the Facebook page, World of Swedish History, where you can chat with me and ask questions. All the best for now. Bye.